But I ended up getting stuck in Michigan, which is the heart of Arab America. And it really made me miss mm. home so much. And one thing that I think Arabs in the diaspora have in common is that they all have this affinity towards their culture. And like the ishq in Arabic, I would call it. And I felt that. So I think when I moved back to Jordan and I started making music, it, we, you know, we came up with the melodies and the beat and everything. And then it was time to come up with the lyrics. And I was writing in English and he's like, no, I think we're going to try this in Arabic. Welcome to another episode of Yellow Less Talk, where we are building a community to help you figure things out. Today we have with us an uprising superstar and national treasure. An amazing singer, Dana Salah. Thank you. What Dana. an intro. Yeah, Dana, we're so, so happy and grateful that you are with us today. I'm so excited to be here. Dana, I haven't seen you in like almost two years. I know, How it's have crazy. You been? I've been good. We actually, for people who don't know, we met at the release party for my first Arabic single, Wayno, And we've just kept in touch ever since. And yeah. I love something that you do that I really love is bring... Arab creators together. It's really awesome. Uh, thank you. Well, it's very easy to bring people together when everyone is just so amazing and talented. And your release party, I still remember that was the first time I was ever introduced to a creative ecosystem. Like I had friends who are content creators and like here and there, but this was the first time I'm like, wow, there's a community in Jordan. And and I loved it. And I really do thank you for for extending that invitation. Of course. I, I didn't even know you back then. And you guys were so like hostess with the mostest like you welcomed me with open arms and i do and i really do thank you so thank you thanks yeah so dana you grew up between jordan and you went to university in the u.s mm -hmm. you started your career as king deco as a pop artist can you walk us through your journey and why you are now dana salah okay wow it's actually been a really long journey when I think about it and I reflect. So I graduated high school and then I went to college at Duke University in North Carolina. And that was kind of like the Arab parents, you know, you have to go to college, you need to get a degree. And to them, they, they just kept saying, you know, afterwards you can explore this music thing, thinking I'd forget about it. But in 2012, after I finished college, I was like, okay, I'm moving to New York, guys. I actually took a job at Ogilvy, an advertising company. And I was like, I'll do that and then I'll do music on the side. But Ogilvy was, you know, the hours were insane and I couldn't manage both. So I quit my job at Ogilvy and I started DJing and songwriting and modeling and all of these side jobs just to be able to stay in New York City and pursue music. And finally in 2014, put out my first song called One as King Deco. And the name King Deco came from, so my name is Dana, and the guy who taught me how to DJ, his name was Nico. So I, as a thank you, I kind of put our names together. And DJing is really what kind of gave me the capability of staying in New York initially. So as a thank you, I changed my DJ name to Deco. But DJ Deco as an artist didn't really make sense. And as soon as I put the word King in front of Deco, it kind of made sense. And it's very cool you picked King because... When you think of king anything, you're thinking of a male. So yeah. when it, it's, it was kind of like a, it was trippy. It was like, oh, King Deco. And then, you know, you have Dana. So my DJing name was Deco. And it was kind of a tribute to the guy who taught me how to DJ because that's what allowed me to stay in New York and sustain myself early on. So his name was Nico. So I took his name and my name and I put them together. Dana, Nico, Deco. And then DJ Deco didn't seem like a right artist name. So when I put the word king in front of it, just everything kind of clicked. The imagery, the the brand, all of it kind of came together. And looking mm -hmm. back, I think it really had to do with the fact that female empowerment was so important to me and having that support. I love that. And for you, the word king, what did that mean to you? Why not Queen Deco? Because when people are thinking King Deco, I'm thinking of a dude. Dude. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I think it was kind of like a gender neutralizing term, you know, mm -hmm. even in a deck of cards, you have king and then queen. Um, so as soon as I put king in front of a female, it's like, okay, it kind of puts us on the same plane. I love that. I love how you're thinking of it from a point of equality as mm -hmm. well. And even through your branding and your music back then, 
It and wasn't just, yeah. it's still there. It's that same spirit. And it's funny because I was incorporating, you know, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. ancient Greek, Greek mythology into my aesthetic as King Deco, um, a lot of water elements. And when I look back, I realized those were all things that I was surrounded by growing up. So in Jordan, we have a lot of Roman ruins scattered mm -hmm. throughout the city. Um, we, I grew up in a drought, so water was a huge topic of conversation and all of these kind of seeped into my art which isn't very different from what I'm doing now I love that it's uh your past experiences are shaping kind of how you express yourself yeah so this is really cool and I want to just go back into you used to sing in English and pop uh -huh. and I house did. and now you've developed this Falahi Arabic pop brand Miss Dana Salah <laughs> how did you transition from English to Arabic music so it happened really naturally. I was, um, I released a song in 2019 called Castaway, and we toured with it, you know, all over the East Coast and the West Coast. We did a little radio tour. And at the time, my manager wanted me to sing a cover for one of the, you know, show, mini shows that we were doing. And I said, you know, I don't know any covers, but I do know this French song. He's like, why can you sing in French? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just like the only song I have memorized. I write a lot of music, but I don't have other people's music totally memorized. Mm -hmm. So when I said that, he was like, let's actually write an original song in French and let's release it in Paris with this label that he was connected with. And of course, with COVID, all of that kind of fell through. But during that time, while we were in LA, we worked on this French song, we worked on this Latin, English, Arabic fusion, and then we worked on another English and Spanish song. And at the time, I thought I was going to be releasing all of this music, but during COVID, I ended up getting stuck in Michigan, which is the heart of Arab America. And it really made me miss mm -hmm. home so much. And one thing that I think Arabs in the diaspora have in common is that they all have this affinity towards their culture. And like, the saishq in Arabic, I would call it. And mm -hmm. I felt that. So I think when I moved back to Jordan and I met Nasir after I got COVID and I started making music, it, we, you know, we came up with the melodies and the beat and everything. And then it was time to come up with the lyrics and I was writing in English and he's like, no, I think we're going to try this in Arabic. But because of my past experiences, I was super open to that. And I had a lot to say, you know, I'd I love realized a lot of differences yeah. between you know, Western culture and our culture and things I liked here and things I liked there and how I wanted to express that through my music. It's funny how that works. I feel like as we're young, we try to stay away as much <laughs> from our culture. But then as we get older, something happens where it's it feels like home and we want to embrace it a little bit more. Yeah. And uh, it's it's an incredible journey to see how everything just happened organically. And it was just more it just it it was fluid it just it flowed and it fell into uh into into where it is today yeah it's really cool to also think how those spanish and french records really did influence the music i'm currently making because if you listen to Wayno, it does have this latin backbeat to it mm, you're right it does mm -hmm. i can now now that you mention it it's definitely it's definitely not your conventional arabic music mm -mm. and and this is actually my next question this falahi sound because with Wayno, you know you're your breakthrough single, it was incredible. And I, I think it's a, a piece of art, both from the sound, from the music video, Thank you. everything about it. But it also Thanks. represents Falahi pop. It does. So why was Falahi pop so important for you? I think just because of my journey, it was very important for me to incorporate Arab culture and heritage into the art that I was making. Yeah. Um, so that was a huge thing. And there's something about like, Falahi culture that has this very nostalgic Jordanian Palestinian feel to it. Mm -hmm. Also, if you think about it, most music came from rural areas or environments where people had less lesser means in order for them to express themselves. So Falahi is just kind of like the root and the essence of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's the earth, right? It's our means of surviving. So that was super important. And then when I looked into it a little bit more, I realized that um, so anyway, so back when I was in LA recording those records, one of the records was a cover of Habibi Anur al Ayn, and I mixed in some Spanish into it. But while I was recording, I'm like, this could easily be a flamenco record. So when I started looking into that, I realized that flamenco came from the Arab mispronunciation of Falah 
Mengu, which means fugitive farmers. Wow, I did not know so that. So all of those things, whether I was conscious or not, all of that seeped into the music that I was making. And I was just doing my best to express my story and be honest to who I was as a person and as an artist. And it just kind of all came together. That's incredible to hear. And I, I think what you just touched upon right now, the importance of authenticity and just well, embracing whatever it is that is part of your identity. Yeah, the parts you like and the parts you don't the, like. It's everything. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you mentioned Falahi music. What is a Palestinian or Jordanian folk song that would be like your top, song right now so obviously i used lolahia dalia in bueno instead of saying dalia i said dana um but a year ago i discovered this palestinian folk song that was sung by palestinian women trying to convey messages to their husbands who are being held captives husbands brothers fathers um that were being held mm -hmm. captive and It was a form of code where they would add a bunch of L's to whatever they were trying to tell them. And some of these messages were trying to tell them that people were going to come and help them break free, telling them how to escape. So one of them is called Yatali'in, and I heard it sung by Reem Benne mm -hmm. and uh, Rila Azar, who are both amazing Palestinian vocalists. That's incredible. That's an incredible background to, to a song. And Dana... I know you sing that song. I saw that cover. I do sing that I song. I saw it on TikTok. I saw it on Instagram. Can you just sing a little bit of a snippet? A snippet? Okay. A snippet. Ya tali'in ayn lil al-jabal ya mulil muqidin al-nar bain lil al-yaman yaman ayn lil al-lana ya roor. Amazing. Yo, and this is a song that was used to as code language mm -hmm. to help by, prisoners escape. Yeah, by Palestinian women. That's incredible. Yo, power to the Palestinian woman, 100%. Like, and I, I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily know the the significance of that song. But can you tell us like what does it actually mean? Like, what is the the words? They're called tarwides. Um, and there's another one called Tarwid al Shamaliya, and it was used to let prisoners know how to escape from the prisons. Fa, um, that one goes, Shamali la liya ha we le la dire shamali la liya we le lo. And it's basically saying, you know, like the exit, to, like the way to escape is from the north. Mm -hmm. So I think all of these songs had different meanings. I'm not entirely sure. What Ya Tali'in means. But I love the fact that they do have these meetings and mm -hmm. it is used as a way to communicate and help people reach freedom. Yeah. Right? It's uh, it's part of our history. It's part of our culture. For sure. And thank you for uh, for bringing us back and reminding us of the beautiful culture and the history that we have. So, Dana, I want to just now shift the conversation on on today's topic, which is expectations. Mm -hmm. So, growing up in the Middle East, as well as in the U.S., what did you feel some of society's expectations were placed on you as an Arab woman? Um, I think as an Arab woman, you are kind of expected to fit a certain role. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a twofold question, right? Arab and woman. So I think as a woman, you're kind of expected to take care of the house, take care of your siblings, take care of your parents, be a good daughter, eventually become a good wife and not to say those are things that I don't want to be or become but my issue I think was having that be my full identity mm. um, Arab on the other hand I think for us the typical route is doctor engineer lawyer something that has been done before and has been proven to work so I think for me as a daughter who came up being like okay I want to be I want to live by myself in New York. I want to pursue a career in music. There were a lot of taboos around everything I wanted to do and everything I wanted to pursue. So it was a little tough getting the family on board, I think. And I think partially I didn't know how to communicate what it was I was trying to do and reassure them that I can still mm -hmm. pursue music and be the daughter that you raised at the same time and it doesn't need to be mutually exclusive i love that so when it comes to expectations you felt that there's expectations as a woman that you needed to 
you know, be a wife, take care of your children, take care of your family. And mm -hmm. then as an Arab, you had to have this whole journey of picking safe career paths that have just been shown to be what typical Arabs would pursue. So for you, those were the expectations, but you wanted to do something that was beyond that. Yes. You didn't want that to be your identity. You wanted Dana Salah to express herself to the world as who she felt that she she was, which mm -hmm. is an artist and someone who's doing so many incredible things right now. Thank you. You mentioned also that it was difficult for you to communicate that with your parents. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey to convincing your parents that this is something that you are meant to be doing? I think that came with them seeing me make music in Arabic and moving back to Jordan, living at home. They were able to see just how much work goes into being an artist. And it's not just going to sing songs and shoot music videos. There's so much going into it. You know, you're you're constantly creating, you're constantly needing to be inspired. That's one side of it. But also nowadays, you're also promoting yourself. You're also mm -hmm. managing your social media. You're connecting with different people. You're working closely with managers, lawyers, business people. So they got to see all of that firsthand. And they were, I think, also so proud to see me incorporate my Arab heritage into my art. And they're cheerleaders now, which is amazing. I love that. I love. But that. I think there was a disconnect before I started doing Arabic, for sure. So just uh, by doing the Arabic music. So I think from what I've gathered from what you just said right now, it was it was a whole journey that after you started putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. they started to see your success yeah. and to started to see what you were doing, not just from a career standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. They started to be like, you know what? This is something really cool. And it's funny how that works, right? Like parents, especially when it comes to unconventional career paths, they'll be like, no, 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 no. Let's not do this. Like you become the engineer, doctor or yep. lawyer. But then when they see there's traction, they're like, hmm, this is actually maybe not a bad thing. So I think it was more than that because there was a lot of traction during the King Deco era. Okay. We charted on Billboard. I performed in front of 15,000 people. Amazing. They were aware of all of this, but I think the difference also comes with owning what you're doing and coming from a place of truly believing you are doing what you're supposed to be doing and nothing is going to get in your way in a kind manner. And I think when I realized and was able to convey to them that I'm still able to be Dana that you raised and an artist expressing who I am and who I want to mm -hmm. be. When I was able to merge those two things together, that's when the name change happened. I was so confident in what I was doing that I didn't feel like I needed the moniker of King Deco anymore. I felt like I was comfortable enough using my own name. And I think it was a mixture of all of these things, them seeing how passionate I was also the traction um, and just seeing how whole of a person I could be doing the art, like do, making my art. I mm -hmm. think all those things together, was able to, I was able to communicate to them that you don't need to be afraid anymore. I love it. And what advice would you give to someone who is trying to convince their parents that, hey, I want to be doing this that's outside the norm? Mm -hmm. I think just doing it doing it and showing them. Sometimes actions really do speak louder than words. And if you can show them what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing, and how it's a, how it can become a, you know, a career just like any other career, mm -hmm. I don't see why they shouldn't get on board. So I, I can see half of our audience saying, yes, ask for forgiveness, not permission. And I can see the other half saying, Gilahwi. like don't, you need sometimes your parents' blessings. Like You do. And I think also like incorporating my culture doesn't just mean incorporating the falahi pop, but yeah. it does mean, you know, staying true to our traditions and our culture. And, you know, we do come from slightly more conservative background. I, you know, take that into consideration when shooting my music videos, when choosing the topics I want to sing about. Not to say that I'm holding myself back in any way, but I am taking into consideration the way I was brought up. And I do like to push the boundary sometimes, but I think there's a way to do it. You mentioned something right now, which is you incorporate, you want to incorporate uh, the values that you grew up with mm -hmm. 
And you want to be mindful of the community and the society you're in. When it comes to expectations, do you feel like that limits you as an artist or do you feel that pushes you further? I think initially I felt like it kind of created a fence around me. But then when I started thinking about it and I started reflecting and, you know, I looked at my whole career and I started asking myself, what are the things that worked? Things that worked happened after I sat with myself and said, okay, what is truly authentic to me? So sometimes I'll look at these limitations and I'll say, okay, does this feel right? Does this feel authentic? And if it does, okay, great. If it doesn't, sometimes when it doesn't, it can also feel a little bit uncomfortable. But if it doesn't feel authentic to me, then I'm going to have to push that boundary. Mm. Can you give us an example? If you don't I mind? mean, as a female, it's obviously like, how revealing do you want to be? And for a while in my music videos, I was a little more conservative than I would be in my day-to-day -day life. And at one point, you know, like there are these fashion, like fashion is a huge part of what I do. And I love incorporating, you know, like the traditional with the modern. And I love fashion just in general. It's a way of expressing mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So there was a point where there was a, you know, an article of clothing or like a look that I really loved, but it was a little more revealing than I had been in my earlier music videos. And I had to ask myself, would I go out like this? And the answer was yes, I would. And I decided, you know, if I would go out like this, there's no reason for me not to wear this in a music video. Okay. So it's, it just, it, it was authentic. I like that. It's being an artist really comes down to being authentic and expressing who you really are mm -hmm. and it sounds like this is something that's a core value of yours so you mentioned a lot about uh, society's expectations you mentioned uh, what others may think in terms of you might wanting to pursue a career as an artist what advice would you give to someone who wants to break free from others judgments i think you need to get to a place where you are so comfortable with yourself so comfortable with your values that you know in your heart of hearts that you're doing the right thing. And I think that's the only way to kind of break free from that. Oh. I've tried the rebelling. I've tried, you know, just saying, I don't care. And mm -hmm. deep down, you always do until you really feel like you're at peace with the questions that you might have mm -hmm. or the insecurities. That's when you truly break free, I think, personally from societal expectations i appreciate that because a lot of it <clears throat> comes within right we, the work has to come within. it's finding your why it's finding your why i love that it's understanding when you say finding your why do you mean in terms of like your purpose or why you're doing what you're doing why, why you is doing? this important to me mm -hmm. why do i why is this something i need to pursue i I, I can definitely appreciate that and one guest that we had Nejwa zabian uh, she's an author of a book called Welcome Home and talks a lot about building a home within. And she talked a lot about this idea that once you build that home within and you do that work within, what other people might think is not going to affect you as much. And I, I, what you're saying right now aligns completely because it is coming from inside. Mm -hmm. It is it's the work that you understand your wise, understanding your values is being authentic. And I can I really commend you uh, for saying that. And you're going to find resistance no matter what you do in life, especially if you're doing something that's off the beaten path. Mm -hmm. And if it's really something that matters and if it's something that's important to you, you have to keep going. Absolutely. Just do. Absolutely. And if you, and that's where the, your why comes in, because yeah. if you really care about it, then you're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. If it's something you're just doing and you're like, you know what, this looks like it could be fun. Guess what? The first punch ain't gonna keep you it's going. It's gonna knock you down. It's gonna knock you down, exactly. That's why, like, reflecting and really sitting with yourself and asking yourself these questions, it's so important. It sounds so cheesy and so cliche, but until I did those things, I, you know, it was easy to, like, mm. sway or, you know, anytime my parents would say something negative, it would really affect me until I made peace with it. Um, and then um, they, mm -hmm. they somehow without even having to have a conversation about it, mm -hmm. ended up on board. I love that. And then just on that note, I'm talking about expectations. What expectation do you find right now in our society? And when I say society, I mean the Middle Eastern society. What expectation or norm do you find toxic? Hmm. 
You know, I think people in general expect women to be catty towards one another and to be competitive and um, sometimes like try to pin women against each other. I think that can be toxic. Yeah. Or if they try and compare you to another artist or I think we're all just so unique and so different as humans, not even as women in our own way that you can overlap and find common ground with someone. But at the end of the day, you're two different people, two different artists. Mm -hmm. I think that can be a little toxic sometimes. And that's interesting you say that because that's not even just about the Middle Eastern culture. This is universal. All over. It's all over. It is very quite unfortunate. Like they always will put women against uh, like, women against each yeah. other. And, and some like of it comes from us. Like we need to be more supportive as women towards each mm -hmm. other and hold a stronger front. But I think the industry and society tends to do that as well. I can see that, especially I feel like with ethnic women as well. Like when it comes to it just what the pool becomes perceived to look a lot For smaller. Sure. And yeah. the comparison doesn't help either. Like I, you know, whenever I incorporate Middle Eastern dance, like, you know, while we were rehearsing, I heard one guy in the back go, Shakira. And Shakira. I mean, trust me, that's a huge, <laughs> massive compliment. But it's always, there's there always needs to be a point of reference when you're looking mm -hmm. at a woman and you have to compare her to someone else. Or maybe but that's with a, people in general. Yeah, it's very interesting. It is a very interesting take on it because someone, you know, Calls you Shakira. It's like you said, it's like, oh, that's a huge, huge compliment. Like, huge. Hey, I'm I love like Shakira. Shakira. Yeah, God bless Shakira. God bless Shakira yeah. for bringing, you know, our culture into the mainstream. Absolutely. And it's, but you are right in the sense that when it comes to societal expectations, we're just expecting two things. One, we're expecting women to go against each other. And it's always, there's always, you know, throughout our history, there's been what, Selena and Hailey Bieber, like the, every Aww. time there's always going to be drama. People want to create that uh, that narrative. I don't know where it comes from, though. It's very interesting. It is very interesting because you, you don't really see it with uh, with guys a lot. Like like no. what Jake Paul and I don't even know, like it's usually it's always girl on girl. Yeah, That's something we should all reflect on, guys. Like, yeah. why, why is it? Why is it? And I think in terms of female empowerment, we are so much stronger when we're together and when we lift each other up. Absolutely. Uh, when women lift each other, when, you know, men as well, and everyone just lifts each other up as well. For sure. And so that's how we move forward as a society. So Dana, it has been said that women in the creative industry face discrimination when they reach a certain age, typically mm. 25 years. Have you felt those roadblocks and how do you go about overcoming it and still succeeding? You know, it's really funny. I feel like this is something I experienced my entire career. And I think this is definitely something you can associate with the creative industry, but I think it's just society in general. You know, women kind of have like an earlier clock than men do. But it's funny because even when I was in New York and I was 23, 24 years old, I was still being compared to the 16 and 17 year old artists who were like, you know, label execs were like, oh, but she's 16, 17, there's more time to mold her. It's like, it's crazy. I was 23 at the time. That's quite a long time ago. And I think it goes back to what we were saying. It's like you compare women to each other and you're, you're pitting them against each other. And I think that's really where the issue is. For me, I feel like as women, we need to be more proud of our age because it comes with so much wisdom. And I think, you know, Dana Salah at 23 or King Deco at 23 wouldn't have written a Wayno, wouldn't have written a Dumtak, wouldn't have written all of the songs that she's mm -hmm. created. Now it's because of my experience and because of my wisdom that I'm able to create the art that I create today, which is so, so different from the art I was creating at 23. You know who you are. You are more at peace with yourself. So yeah, I definitely experienced the ageism thing, but I experienced it my entire journey that's that's nuts which to is think. crazy it is crazy like i think one of my favorite quotes is is you know life does not stop after 25 it's gonna continue going and you like you said you're gonna get lots of wisdom and you're gonna use those experiences to express your art or to express yourself yeah. in whatever you're doing and what I find very interesting, what you just said right now, is you've experienced it your whole entire and life. And I think that was for ages. a reason, because I wouldn't have the confidence to do what I'm doing now in my 30s if I didn't go through that in my 20s, because mm -hmm. I would be like, okay, nope, I passed 25, it's over. But even at 25, people were like, oh, it's too late. 
So Dana, thank you so much for coming today. You talk to us about music. You talk to us about the expectations in society and how you were able to navigate and how can someone overcome what other people think of them. You talk to us about ageism in the creative industry as well as having a growth mindset. Is there an exciting project you want to talk to us about and where can people follow you? People can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Everything is either Dana Salah or Dana Salah Music. I was also just in New York shooting a music video for my upcoming single, Ghazale, which will be out, inshallah, after Eid. Um, yeah, that's some of the stuff I'm working Amazing. on. Amazing. Ghazale, we can't wait to hear it. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sound? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we shot the music video for Ghazale in New York, which is where I spent most of my career, my early days. So we wanted to showcase the different parts of New York City that, you know, I spent a lot of my time in, but also pay homage to the Spotify billboard that went up for the Equal Arabia pro program. Um, so we shot a lot of it in Times Square, in Brooklyn, in Harlem, all of these different places while incorporating my Arabic heritage through the fashion. Um, you can subscribe to Yalla Let's Talk on YouTube, Spotify, Instagram, and Angami.